gives me great pleasure in greeting you in the name of the ECB ministry, New Life in Jesus. My dear beloved, this evening uh, I would like to speak to you from the Gospel of John, chapter 21. And the title of my message is Discipleship, Christian Discipleship, or Being Followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Being a Christian simply means to follow Jesus. And here in this uh, 21st chapter of the Gospel of John, we have some three very clear definitions of what it is to live and the Christian life, what it is to be a Christian. Or if you ask the question, what is a Christian? What is it to live the Christian life? We find this chapter helps us greatly. I begin by reminding you that it's a chapter that speaks of the resurrected Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ who had risen in both body and the literal resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ as body and soul. And we find that this Savior, the Lord who had risen, is now at the shore of the sea meeting with his disciples. My friends, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus is so central to the Christian faith. And I think it is very important for us to recognize that the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, his burial, uh, didn't end with that. He rose victoriously and literally bodily rose from the dead with a new body that could inhabit all eternity. He will be the same in his glorious body, God, and at the same time, true man for eternity, the second person in the Trinity. Now, the reason that the resurrection of Jesus is important, let me, for instance, uh, give you uh, one reason that it is very important to grasp that, is that it tells us that the work of Jesus on the cross is a finished work. The work of salvation of God is a completed work. There is nothing else to be done, but God, what he began to do, completed it at the cross of Christ and his sufferings and in his agony and in his death for our sins. Remember the great barrier between the living God and us is our rebellion against God, our hostility, our enmity, against God, our sin against the Holy God who has created us. Remember that God is the God of all nations, of all people. He is not the God of one nation or one locality, but He created the heavens and the earth, and all people were made by Him. And my friends, when Jesus died to pay the penalty for our sins and our guilt on the cross, he died, the Bible says, condemned for our sins. He died bearing the curse of the law of God that was upon us. It was passed onto him, laid upon him. He died as a substitute in our place. Jesus stood condemned before the majestic throne of God that he might bear away our sins, that we might be set free forgiven by God and accepted into the very presence of the living God, our Maker. And my friends, when Jesus died, remember the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. Remember death outside Jesus is a death in sin and for sin. It is a terrible thing to die outside Jesus without Christ. Because death without Christ carries the curse of God, who indeed says the, the wages of sin is this death that will separate us and bring us into eternal condemnation and separation from God and His goodness and His presence, bearing upon ourselves the very anger and the wrath and the weight and the curse of our sin. So my friends, when Jesus rose from the dead, what does he tell us? You know that when a criminal is condemned, punished, 
somebody carries his guilt and the law punishes him, he is, for instance, put inside the prison. He is, he is cast into the dungeon and he must bear the punishment, the weight of his guilt and of his sin and of the breaking, the transgression of the law. But when that punishment is over, when he has paid the full penalty and the price, then, my friends, he cannot be kept inside that prison. He must be set free. The law that is just is a law that will never punish a person beyond the wait until the full price is paid. And, my friends, the wonderful thing is that the resurrection of the Lord Jesus tells us that the full price for our sin and our guilt has been paid by God who became flesh. Jesus bore our sins on the cross. Jesus took our guilt upon himself. Jesus took the very condemnation of God upon him that was upon us. Jesus stood in our place. And oh, my friends, the resurrection tells us that the price had been paid and therefore death cannot keep Jesus anymore. Therefore it tells us that God cannot shut him up in the dungeon of hell. God cannot keep him imprisoned in that curse, in that death for sin. He has been, the full price had been paid. The justice of God is satisfied. God himself might now receive us in Jesus, freely forgiven, accepted, loved, and oh, my friends, the Bible tells us nothing ever can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Oh, my friends, do you see that? That's why the Christian life is a glorious life. We do not anymore live in fear that our sin might find us out. We do not live in that sense of terror and tension and suspicion. What will happen to us if we are found out? If one day we stand before the living God, if others come to know this and that. Because, oh my friends, we also fear, you know, some fear, oh, that some curse might come upon me, or oh, some demon might find me, and all kinds of fears dominate us. But the Bible says, because God has received us forever, the price is paid and Jesus is risen, and he is now fully paid the, the price for our past sins, the present and the future. There is nothing else, my friends, that stands between God and us. We are accepted, in fact, we are received, we are loved, and the Bible even goes beyond that, my friends. The Bible says God delights in us. God rejoices in us. When God sees us, so to speak, his heart is full of joy. Oh, my friends, he loves us, and in his love there is no shadow. There is nothing, oh, my friends, that can ever reduce or diminish his love, his compassion, his grace and his passion for us. There is no change. In the, that's why the Bible says he has loved us with an everlasting love. God has always loved us even before the foundations of the world, the heavens and the earth. And there at the cross and at the resurrection, everything has been complete. And what a wonderful thing, oh my friends. And if you are not a Christian, again, on my friends, I beg you, I plead with you to recognize your position. You see, you are still living in separation from God. You are still, my friends, carrying the condemnation of God. You are still, my friends, bearing the burden of your sin, of your guilt before the holy, the living God who created you. And one day, none can escape him. You must stand before him. Oh, my friends, before the great day comes, before the time that your heart becomes so hardened, oh, my friends, that you cannot look to Jesus, I plead with you this day, come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Look. Behold the Saviour crucified for your sins, and oh, my friends, live. Now, in this in particular narrative in the in the Gospel of John, chapter twenty-one, there are three things, at least, that are said uh, that are very important to us. My friends, once we come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, trust Him, 
and we become his disciples, we receive him. There are three important things this chapter defines and these are found, for instance, in verse 12 in the words of Jesus. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast, sup with me, eat with me. So my friends, in the first instance we find that the risen Lord Jesus invites us to communion, to fellowship with him. He is the living Savior. Although, remember, he is physically separated from us because he is risen. He is ascended Lord who will one day return again. He is still from heaven. He says, come, the Holy Spirit of God will draw us into the presence of God. And there we can rejoice and have communion while we live here on earth. The second is, we are called to love the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, he looks, Jesus looks at one of the disciples and asks, asks him, do you love me more than this? Do you love me? So the second aspect, my friends, of the Christian love, what is a Christian? What is Christian love? It is to love the Lord Jesus. The third thing is found in verse 22 of John chapter 21. If it be my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. So the third aspect, my friends, that Jesus calls you to do is to follow him while you live here on earth. Now we are going to look at these three things. You know, in the first instance, the disciples were fishing and their life has failed, and their task has failed. They have not caught anything and the whole night they had tried, they attempted and they were frustrated, they had failed and there was nothing empty-handed they stood there in the boat, in the sea. And Jesus comes to them, he says, he asks them, children, do you have any fish? Have we caught anything? Have we been successful? You see, my friends, when Jesus finds us in our troubles, in our trials, in our failures, in all the difficulties of our life, he comes to us, the risen Savior, Jesus. He seeks after, he comes to them, and he asks them, how is it going? He is asking you this evening, this day. You see, my friends, the risen Lord Jesus Christ, although he is the Lord of glory, the God of all power and majesty, is a God who takes such tender concern and loving care over you. And that is why, my friends, you know, he doesn't stand far off. He comes in the storms of life. He comes when we are troubled and we do not see the future. We know none of us have control over our future. We do not know what trials, what troubles, what, what difficulties that awaits us. But oh my friends, one thing we know is our Savior, the Lord Jesus, the living God, comes to us. You see, this is the difference between faith and fear. Many in our times live in fear. You know, fear looks at the trouble, circumstance, and the failures, the sins, and our difficulties, our problems. Fear is something that, is, that we are mastered by the situation, the circumstance, the trials that we are in. And that is fear. But my friends, you see, faith indeed looks to the Lord who rules over these circumstances. Faith looks to the living God who is the master of our circumstances, of our failures, of our struggles, of our difficulties. And this is the difference. My friends, you see, we live in a world where people are full of fear and anxieties. Why is that? Because we look, my friends, to all that is around us, to our experiences, to our future. And we know that we have no control. We know anything can go with this way or that way. That's why even parents, children, we live in a sense of anxiety and of fear. And we pass on this sense even to our children. But oh, my friends, God calls you this day to live by faith. Faith means your trust is upon the living God, the Savior, the Lord Jesus, who is the master of storms, 
who is the master of your failures, who is the master of your trials, of your troubles, and he will lead you through it and bring you out victoriously. He will never fail you. And now you see, the Lord Jesus commands them, come and sup with me. And you see, Peter runs to Jesus. Peter gets out from the boat, he puts on the coat and he gets into the water and he runs to the Lord Jesus. Peter wants to be with Jesus. You see, my friends, that the, the situation here, they have had a major catch, major success, major blessing from God. Peter doesn't stay with the blessing. Peter doesn't stay with his success. Peter doesn't stay with the material thing gain in this life and say, here is my blessing, and he stays with it. He leaves it all, he runs, he flees to be with Jesus. His heart longs for communion with the living God, with the psalmist, he cries out, O oh God, my soul thirsts after you. My heart thirsts after the living God. Oh, my friends, do you see, today we speak so much of blessings of this. God has blessed us with many things. But isn't it true, these blessings have got between us and God. We have forgotten Him. We are always seeking this. We are always preoccupied with this. We are preoccupied with all the situations, all that we can gain for us, for our children. We are so caught up in it. And when God blesses us, oh my friends, we linger with that and we find that it begins to rise and to hinder our fellowship with God. Learn from Peter, my friends. He leaves the catch of fish. He forgets it because his heart's desire is to commune, to be in the presence of Jesus. Today he too invites you, come, come to him, go to him, my friends. You know, it is even in small things where we read the scriptures, the Bible, where we pray. You know, I, when I was a young student, 18 years, I came from a, by God, thanks be to God, a godly family. Both grandfather was a God-fearing, minister, ordained minister of the Anglican Church. My father again was an ordained, a God-fearing, respected man of integrity, he was a man of prayer from the Anglican Church. Although I was brought up in this godly way at 18, I came to England. I was, in a sense, I would have been lost. But you see, in a wonderful way, God gave me a roommate, an Englishman. He was about 22 years, he was senior to me, I was about 18, and we shared the room. You know, something i never forgotten is this. Every morning, this friend will read the Bible before he goes to the university. For, for about 15 minutes, with a notebook, 20 minutes, he will read the Bible. And every morning after reading the Bible, he will get down on his knees and pray to God. Then in the evening after he comes back from the university, before going to bed again, he will go on his knees by the bedside and pray. He will encourage me in the faith. And oh, my friends, what a great blessing he was. Till today, he is a friend to me. Forty years have gone by, and still I remember him with thankfulness. And what a joy it was to meet him, even recently, in London. Oh, he's working at a hospital close by, walking with God, rejoicing with God. He prayed for me and my wife and for us before we parted again this day. You see, my friends, young people, you need to learn to rejoice and to have communion with the Lord Jesus daily. And you must be example to the younger people, whether younger men, younger women, they need people who delight to commune with the Lord Jesus. The second aspect, my friends, is this. Jesus asked Peter, Peter, do you love me more than this? You see, it's a wonderful thing that God, the living God, should look on us and ask us, Do you love me? It is an amazing thing, my friends, that the God of all glory and power and majesty, 
the triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they are lived in love and delight with each other. They were those who were completely fulfilled, satisfied within himself. The living, the triune, the self-existent God, he needs nothing beside himself. Loving each other from all eternity, this glorious God, our Maker, Oh, my friends, he looks at you and me and asks, Do you love me? That he should ask for our love to him. My friends, I ask you, Do you love the Lord Jesus? You see, Peter, when he asks Peter, Jesus asks, Do you love me more than this? There are two different kinds of interpretation of more than this. Some believe when Jesus said, do you love me more than this? He meant the success of the catch. You know, they have got a great success in their job, in their whatever it is. You have got a great gain, a blessing, something you have gained in this world. So Lord Jesus asked him, Peter, do you love me more than the success of your career, of your job, of your future, of your money that you have gained? You say, do you love me more than what you have acquired, your degrees, your grades? Oh, my friends, this is what Jesus asks you this evening. This day he asks, looks at you and asks, do you love him beyond all that you possess and have and been blessed with? If you do not, my friends, there is some deep defect in your faith, in your life. And the second uh, way of looking at this, my friends, is this. Some look at it and say, when Jesus asks, do you love me more than this? Remember, Peter has once abandoned Jesus. He ran away with all the disciples. They thought that Jesus had failed. And then they ran away. Peter also, remember, denied and he walked away from Jesus. And now he's going with his friends fishing. You see, the same Peter who walked away from Jesus, who withdrew from Jesus, is now with his friends. And then we ask ourselves, our Lord Jesus asks ask us too, do we love him more than our friends? For us, sometimes our friends, as we have said, so strong bond that is good to have good friendship. He asks us, do you love him more than your family, the husband, your wife, your children, all that he has blessed with, the people that are precious to you, vital to you, that your heart loves them, clings to them, delights in them. And yet Jesus asks, do you love me more than this? You see, my friends, one thing that we must remember is that in our love to others, there is always a defect. There is something incomplete. Our love has sharp edges. Sometimes our love has disappointments. Sometimes our love for others has a measure of bitterness. Sometimes anger. Sometimes anguish. But my friends, the love that God has for us is a love that has filled with pure and fervent and steadfast love that never fades. The love of God is pure. The love of God is fervent, it has nothing incomplete, no defect in it. The love with which the eternal God loves us, my friends, is a deep, passionate, fervent, pure and constant love. The more we come to love him, we will soon find the more we come to love others. It is so important. You see, I remember when uh, we got married, my wife, the man who preached the sermon, he said, Imagine a triangle. You are both sinners. The more you grow closer in loving the Lord Jesus Christ, the more you will grow close to each other. You see, the more that we love the Lord Jesus, the more we will love each other. So the more that you will love others. My friends, so the question today also is this. Do you love the Lord Jesus? I now come to the last and the closing point. You see, he asked Peter, he asked Peter, what is that to you? You follow me. 
So Jesus, in fact, asked, follow him. You see, the, in a sense, Peter was asking, what about the other John? What about him? And Jesus says, what is that to you? His life with God. You see, in a sense, our Lord Jesus is telling us, it is not our business what the lives of others are. We are sometimes so curious about the lives of others. We compare our lives with others. We compare our children. Are our children more successful? Are our children more beautiful? Are we richer, wealthier? Do we have a better house? And we are constantly comparing, looking at the lives of others. We are looking at the failures. We look at so many, so many of these, of these um, movies and all these uh, teledramas because we are constantly looking into the private lives of others. But my friends, God tells us this day, that is not your business. You follow me. So I close by asking this question, my friends. Jesus wants you to put the life and the will of God first in your life. Following Jesus means, my friends, that you don't live according to your will. Not my will, O God, but your will be done. Are you living for the glory of God? Are you seeking the will of God in your life? Oh, my friends, are you walking? that you might indeed be to the praise of God and to the blessing of others. What is your life story with the living God? May God help us. Let us pray together. Our eternal and ever-living God, we thank you that you have called us to follow him and to live to the praise of him, the living Savior, that we might be blessed, O oh God, to the lives of others and lived a worthwhile life. Give us grace, O oh God, not to waste our lives, but to live lives that are worthy in your sight. And O oh God, will be truly blessed to others and for the extension of your kingdom. Through our Lord Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.